I challenge myself to be Pokemon Fire Red using Blue's team from the Pokemon Adventures manga. Except, there's one thing. Hang on guys, let me show you something. This is Blue's team. Yeah, in the manga, Blue's actually a pretty good trainer. He didn't like weak Pokemon, so no Butterfree Yellow, and no Sunflora Gold. You should use your favorite Pokemon? Well, okay, my favorite Pokemon are Lander's Therian and Ferrothorn. So, this challenge might be a little easy, but I'll make sure it's worth your time. First off, I decide to challenge myself to hack the game code and change some sprites around. I found a program that goes through every sprite available and... I totally forgot this was in the game. I wanted to change the player sprites to blue and the rival sprites to red, but since I'm new to ROM hacking, some of the results were a little off-putting. Oh, red's looking pretty normal, huh? Let me just name him and, uh... Oh, and there's walking animations for red and blue, so switching those around was pretty easy. The palette swap affected some other sprites, but I quickly fixed those too. Except these text bubbles. We don't talk about these text bubbles. There aren't sprites for blue when he runs or bikes or flies or surfs or basically anything. I made some custom ones in Photoshop, but I couldn't for the life of me import my edited sprites, so I just reused blue's walking animation for running. Everything else like flying, surfing, or biking, I'll just edit around. Don't pay too much attention, okay? Ignore this whole section when I surf to Cinnabar too. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell. Somebody not know how to flush the toilet after they've had a shit? DISGUSTING! Other than that, standard Nuzlocke rules apply. Let's do this. As usual, our adventure starts in Pallet Town. You guys already saw what I looked like in the intro, but look at this! I can walk around the overworld as blue, and my trainer card matches too. I go outside and... Yeah, this was my first test to see if my modding worked. I forgot to replace the sprites for my rival, so I had two blues running around the world. It was pretty funny when I challenged myself to a battle. Okay, take two. I started up a new save file, get jump scared again, and get back to where we were. In the lab, I meet Professor Oak and Red. Now Red is the snarky Nepo baby instead of us. Red accidentally picked Squirtle instead of his signature sore, and I picked Charmander. In the manga, Blue received his Charmander from Professor Oak while Red got Bulbasaur. One of my favorite panels is the first time we see him in action, which was against a wild Mew. I name him Delta and add him to the team. We take out Red Squirtle and officially start our journey. By the way, look at this beautiful animation. Blue's back sprite doesn't exist in the game, so I found this back sprite online and sized it down to meet the game's dimensions. In the end, it turned out really nice. Shout out mid117, your pixel art is definitely not mid. On Route 1, I get our first encounter, a Pidgey named Kite. Pidgeot was one of Blue's main team members. He would often take to the skies to scout out areas or to deliver letters to Professor Oak. Later on, Blue replaced him with Rhydon, but I'll be keeping Pidgeot. Real quick, let me get into our encounter so we're on the same page. Blue uses a Rhydon and a Caesar, both of which are found in the Safari Zone. I can only catch one Pokemon per area, so I decided to go with Caesar since Scyther was Blue's first Pokemon. Oh, also, I can't get Ninetales in Fire Red. Everyone else is eligible though. After catching Kite, that's it. That's all the encounters before Brock. And looking at my team... yeah, it's gonna be a struggle. I work on training the team to match Brock's Onyx, and in that time, I backtrack to Route 22 to take on our rival. And wow, there's something menacing about Red walking up to us. He's caught a Pidgey too, but we easily take him out. With the team maxed out, it's time to take on Brock. I know the battle will be difficult, but Delta learned Metal Claw before the fight, so it should be manageable. Also, I get close to the next level so we can level up during the fight. Brock leads with his Geodude, and I lead with Delta. Delta takes out Geodude with a few Embers, which brings out his Onyx. I know I can tank a Rock Tomb, so I stay in and fish for a burn from Ember, which we get on the first try. Onyx does go for Rock Tomb, but it barely does any damage. Two Metal Claws later, and Onyx goes down, winning us the first gym battle. After the battle, Delta evolves into Charmeleon. I always love that Blue has a Charmeleon on his team. His sly grin matches so well with his trainer's attitude. The three of us travel through Mount Moon and arrive at Cerulean City. In this time, Kite evolves into Pidgeotto. I have the option of challenging Misty first, but I know she will demolish our two team members with 100% accurate Swifts and powerful Stab Water Pulses. Instead, I head north to get our next encounter. But before we can do that, we're challenged by Red at Nugget Bridge. He leads with Pidgeotto, but Delta and Kite easily take him out. The rest of his team easily goes down too. 
poor guy pressed B on his Squirtle evolution twice. On the next route, I catch our next team member, an Abra named Kaza. In the manga, Alakazam was one of the wild Pokemon that attacked Red and Blue. He along with Exeggutor and Arcanine were taken down by Caesar, and Blue managed to catch all three. I immediately level up Kaza to evolve him into a Kadabra. Unfortunately, I have some bad news. While clearing through Nugget Bridge, Kite overlevels past the level cap of 21. I'm forced to keep Kite in the PC, so with our team of two, the battle against Misty will be really difficult. Overleveling can be difficult with only two team members, so I should have been more careful and avoided the optional trainers. After leveling up Kaza, I try to take on Misty. Misty leads with Staryu, and I lead with Delta. Delta outspeeds and lands a critical hit Mega Punch, one-shotting the Staryu. Okay, maybe this run is possible. Starmie comes out and takes out both Kaza and Delta. Yeah, this run was never happening. Even with Kite on the team, it would still be difficult because Starmie's stab water pulse just does too much damage. <sighs> Back to square one. On the next attempt, I don't even make it past Brock. This time, I went in with a different strategy. I didn't want to rely on getting lucky with the burn, so I tried leading with Kite to lower Geodude's accuracy so Delta could set up on him. After 6 sand attacks, Delta comes in and spams Metal Claw. With each hit, we have a 10% chance to get an attack buff. After 6 chances, we get... 0 buffs. Onyx then comes in and takes our team out. On to attempt 3 then. This time, I use the same strat as before, leading with Kite to use sand attack. 6 sand attacks later, and Delta comes in again. After 5 Metal Claws, Geodude goes down, and Delta gets 0 buffs again. Way to go, champ. At this point, I realize that the only thing saving me is RNG. Onyx seems to pick his moves at random, so as long as he uses Tackle or Bind, we'll be fine. My only win condition is to lower his accuracy with Sand Attack or hope for a burn before he randomly selects Rock Tomb. I stain and spam Ember, and for some reason, Onyx never uses Rock Tomb. Delta gets the burn at the very end, defeating Onyx and winning us our first gym badge. At this point, I take some time and catch up to the first attempt. Nothing different happens, but I'm more careful with the avoidable trainer battles. With everything ready, I challenge Misty one more time. This time, I lead with Kaza against her Staryu. Since Staryu isn't Psychic type yet, it's an easy one shot with Psybeam. Starmie comes out next, and trades attacks against Kaza. We both manage to confuse each other, but a held Persian Berry cures our confusion. I switch into Kite while Starmie only hurts itself in confusion. Another quick attack, and Starmie goes down, winning us a second gym badge. Before we take on Lieutenant Surge, we can get another eligible encounter, a Machop in Rock Tunnel. But in order to do that, we first have to clear through the SSN to get the HM for Cut. On the way to the Captain, we get stopped by Red again. His team wasn't too difficult. Delta easily takes out Pidgeotto, and Red sends out Wartortle. Hey, look who finally evolved! Wartortle has Bite for Kaza and Water Gun for Delta, so I stay in with Kite to lower his accuracy with Sand Attacks. War Turtle only sets up Withdraw, so I switch into Kaza to take out the War Turtle with the Side Beam. Raticate comes out next, so I set up a Reflect before switching out to Delta to take out the Giant Rat with a few Embers. Hey guys, it's all well actually contrary to popular belief, your Rebels Raticate was not killed. The Raticate you fight on the SSN is in fact a different Pokemon from the run that you fought earlier. You can see my entire explanation in my video, but hey, that's just a theory. A uh, game theory. Thanks for watching. Okay, thank you Madpat, that's enough. Red sends out Kadabra, and the cheeky fella uses Disable before we're able to attack. He then lowers our accuracy with Kinesis, which causes Mega Punch to miss. I switch back to Ember as Kadabra misses a Disable, then trick him by switching it up with Mega Punch as he disables our Ember, which wins us the battle. After getting the HM for Cut, I take a detour to Rock Tunnel to get our next encounter, Dazel the Machop. Named after, of course, In the manga, Machamp was one of Blue's original Pokemon. During a team mix-up with Red, Machoke and the rest of Blue's team got switched with Red's team. Blue immediately started training Polly, Pika, and Sore, but Blue's Pokemon did not listen to Red. He tried to convince them to play in the river, but instead, they started training on their own. After switching their teams back, Machoke evolves into Machamp. I catch our Machop and level him up to the level cap to get ready to challenge Lieutenant Surge. Surge leads with Voltorb, and I lead with Dazel for his first major battle. Dazel easily takes out Voltorb and his Pikachu immediately after. Raichu comes out last, and to avoid a potential crit, I switch into Kaza, who takes Raichu out with the Psybeam, winning us the battle and our third gym badge. I head through Rock Tunnel again, this time going through to the other side and arriving at Lavender Town. 
At this point, Lou doesn't have enough Pokemon for Professor Oak's aid to give him the HM for Flash, so I have to blindly stumble through the cave. After battling the trainers, Dazel evolves into Machoke. On Route 8, I get our next encounter, a Growlithe named Amber. In the manga, Arcanine was one of the Pokemon that attacked Blue and Red, along with Alakazam and Exeggutor. But since we have Delta on the team, I won't be using Amber much for this playthrough. I make my way through the route and get to seal it on City. Here, I can get my next encounter, the elusive Porygon. But in order to get Porygon, I need to have a full coin case. After bumming around for coins on the ground, I tried gambling to test my luck. I ended up setting up a script to automatically gamble for us. After maxing out our coin case, I head next door to pick up our encounter, Chell the Porygon. In the manga, Lou got his Porygon from the Celadon game corner, just like we did. Later on, his Porygon evolved into Porygon 2. Real quick, I used the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to make evolutions like Machamp, Porygon 2, Caesar, and Alakazam possible in the base game. It's definitely more fun to use these Pokemon than normally would be impossible in a regular playthrough. The power of science is amazing. With all possible encounters obtained, I level up the team and challenge Erica. I'ma be honest, this battle won't be difficult. Delta, Kite, and Amber are super effective on everyone. Kaza is super effective against Victory Bell and Vileplume, and Chell knows Psybeam, so they're included too. And Dazel's just chilling in the back. Erica leads with her Vileplume, and I lead with Chell. Victory Bell immediately poisons us, but Chell lands a critical hit Psybeam, one-shotting Victory Bell. Tangela comes out next, so I switch into Amber, who tanks a pretty decent Giga Drain. Tangela poisons us, but Amber easily takes Tangela out. In hindsight, I should have bought a Firestone from the department store and evolved Amber into Arcanine for the extra stats. Ember would have one-shot Tangela, but honestly, it's not a big deal. Vileplume comes out last, so I switch into Delta. A couple Embers later, and Vileplume is in the red. Delta gets paralyzed, so I switch into Kite, who takes a Vileplume out with a quick attack, winning us the fourth gym badge. Now it's time for our regularly scheduled story elements. We storm through Rocket Hideout and demolish Giovanni and his grunts. Hey, I wonder what Giovanni's looking at. Jesus, man! You actually find this stuff funny? Not sure if Pokemon or Titanic? What is wrong with you? Anyway, we challenge this loser to a Pokemon battle. Giovanni leads with Onix, and I lead with Dazel. Onix easily goes down to a single low kick. Rhyhorn comes out next, who meets the same fate. Last is his Kangaskhan, who falls to a Karate Chop and a low kick, winning us the battle. I pick up his self scope and immediately head over to Lavender Tower. Before we can go any further, we're challenged again by Red. This time, he's just standing there with his back turned and... Hey guys, it's me, Matt Pet again. I know your rival's text makes it sound like his Raticate died, but I assure you he's not. I made a big video disproving the theory, so please stop saying it. Anyway, shout out to Magnus Pokemon. Make sure you guys like and subscribe to his channel. I'm off to make another Five Nights at Freddy's theory. See you guys later. Oh, thanks, MatPat. Appreciate your authentic and very real message. Anyway, Red leads with Pidgeotto, and I lead with Chell. I taught Chell Shockwave, and with our level difference, it's an easy one-shot. Red sends out Growlithe next, who gets taken out by Chell as well. Red sends out Execute, so I switch into Amber to take him out. Wartortle is up next, but a few Shockwaves from Chell takes him out as well. Last is Kadabra, but Delta makes quick work of him too. Not much to say about this battle. Red should have paid attention to the level caps, I guess. After that, I climb up Lavender Tower and rescue Mr. Fuji from the Rocket Grunt. He gives us the Poke Flute, so I head left of Celadon to wake up the sleeping Snorlax. These Snorlax are pretty easy when you're not trying to catch them. Watch this. Poor guy should have learned from Snore and used Harden first. After clearing the Snorlax, we can head through Cycling Road and- oh my god. Pause, pause. Cut all of this. I couldn't import the proper sprites, so when I hop on my bike, I turn into Bizarro Red. Forget this, nothing big happens on this route. Instead, I quickly run to Fuchsia City to get the good rod for our next encounter, a Psyduck. Except you need the Super Rod for Psyduck. So I backtrack and head south of Lavender Tower to get the Super Rod before getting our last encounter, Momo the Psyduck. Named after, of course, Ducky Momo. Our Momo doesn't hate people though. In the manga, Golduck was one of Blue's main team members. Although he's not a psychic type, Golduck would use his psychic powers to see things and communicate telepathically with the Pokedex display. A really cool moment from Red and Blue's adventures was when Mr. Mime set up a giant barrier around Saffron City. Golduck used his psychic powers to view the inside of the city, and Pika used Substitute to sneak in. 
Using Golduck's help, he was able to locate the Mr. Mime and take him out, shutting down the barrier and letting our heroes enter. Next, I head back down to Fuchsia City for our next encounter at the Safari Zone. It took a while to find him, but eventually, we find our Scyther. Totally didn't spend 20 minutes in the wrong area. I'll be honest, I don't know how the Safari Zone odds work. I was too scared to throw some bait or a rock, so I just threw Safari Balls. Luckily, Scyther went in on the second ball. Not a fan of Safari Zone encounters, but I'm happy I could add him to the team. By the way, if you can figure out what Scyther's nickname is from, I'll pin your comment. No cheating, please. In the manga, Blue Scyther was with him since childhood. He was Blue's first Pokemon, so I'm glad that he was able to join the team. Before continuing the gym challenge, I train up the team a little more. In that time, Delta evolves into Charizard, Kite evolves into Pidgeot, Chell evolves into Porygon 2, and Momo evolves into Golduck. Basil and Lemur try to evolve too, but I decided to keep them because I never use Machoke and I want to spend a little more time with Scyther before evolving him. I also decided to take on the Sylph Code before we challenge Koga and Sabrina. While storming the tower, we're challenged by Red again. We're actually pretty even leveled for this fight, but we easily take him out. Also, I get the Lapras from the Lapras guy. In the manga, Blue briefly caught a Lapras on his adventures. He ended up giving it to a little kid after saving his haunter. Since we have Momo, I won't be using Lapras either. Before we go any further, I return to Fuchsia City to take on Koga. Our team is a few levels under the level cap, but while clearing out Sylphco, Basil evolved into Machamp and Lemur evolved into Caesar. With the fully evolved team and an outright immunity with Lemur's steel typing, I think this will be a fairly easy fight. Koga leads with his coughing and I lead with Chell, who immediately takes the coughing out with a Psychic. Koga sends out Muck next, who manages to tank a Psychic and set up a Minimize. Chell then misses its next Psychic, and Muck manages to poison us with Sludge. I stay in and use Recover before taking out the Muck with the Psychic. Next up is Koga's second Coffin. I recover back some HP before taking him out with the Psychic as well. Last is Koga's Weezing, so I switch into Lemur to absorb the Sludge. This isn't competitive Pokemon, so no Fire Blast, thankfully. Lemur sets up a Sword Stance on Weezing before taking him out with a few Slashes, winning us a 5th Gym Badge. Okay, back to the story. I go back up through Sylphco and easily wipe out Giovanni. He tries to show us more funny images from the internet, but we're not having it. Momo takes out his Nidorino and Nidoqueen, and Dazel takes out his Kangaskhan and Rhyhorn. That's badge number... oh, oops, that's later. Giovanni leaves and we rescue the president of Sylphco, who gives us a Master Ball. With the team close to the level cap, I head straight to Sabrina. She leaves with Kadabra and I lead with Delta. Delta absolutely mops the floor with Sabrina's Pokemon. He easily takes out her Kadabra, Mr. Mime, and Venomoth. Her Alkazam gives us more trouble though, getting a special defense drop on Delta. I know he can't survive another Psychic, so I switch into Lemur to resist the attack. I busted out my calculator to see if we could survive another Psychic, since we're underleveled and I don't think even my bulkiest team member could survive two Psychics. Since the first Psychic did 37 damage, with the special defense drop, the next Psychic should do 37 divided by 2 thirds, which is 55 damage. I decide to stay in and Lemur tanks it. We retaliate with the Slash, taking out the Alakazam and winning us a 6th Gym Badge. I continue with the Gym Challenge, surfing south of Pallet Town to reach Cinnabar Island. Oops, cut this footage too. I stumble my way through the Pokemon Mansion and find the secret key. By the way, I think this is the first time I've seen this interaction in Fire Red and Leaf Green. I guess I've never used a Steel type against a Magnemite before. With the secret key, we unlock the Gym and challenge Blaine. Momo easily takes out all of Blaine's team, this should say I hate people and fire types. Delta tags in for the final Arcanine, but that was a very easy battle, despite being way under the level cap. That's badge number 7. As we leave the gym, Bill pulls us aside to help him with the Sevi Islands. Normally you can just say no to his offer and continue with the gym challenge, but I wanted to get one last encounter here. In Barry Forest, I get my last encounter, a Wild Execute. Executor was one of the Pokemon that attacked Blue and Red along with Alakazam and Arcanine. I won't use Executor, but I wanted to catch him to complete the encounters. And since this is our last encounter, I use the very precious Master Ball to guarantee this difficult catch. Into the PC you go. After helping Bill, we're no longer held hostage on Sevi Islands and can return to Kanto to challenge Giovanni. He leads with Rhyhorn and I lead with Momo. And it's a pretty easy sweep with Surf. One by one, all of Giovanni's Pokemon fall to the hands of this people hating duck. This should say I hate people, and fire types, and ground types. That's badge number 8. On the way to Victory Road, we're challenged one last time by Red. 
All his Pokemon go down pretty easily, so I won't go into too much detail. Alakazam gave us a little scare, but it wasn't a challenge at all. After going through the Bad Checkers and clearing through Victory Road, we make it to the Pokemon League. Before I take on the Elite Four, I backtrack to get a few items. I teach Amber Thief and steal a Sharp Beak from a Wild Fero for Kite, a Black Belt from the Fighting Dojo for Dazzle, and a Focus Band from a Wild Machoke for Caesar. I also give the Quick Claw to Chell, the Mystic Water to Momo, and the Charcoal to Delta. Unfortunately, Blue doesn't catch enough Pokemon, so I can't unlock the Item Finder to get the Hidden Leftovers. With the team leveled up to match Lance's Ace Dragonite at level 60, we're ready to take on the Elite Four. Here's a quick preview of the team. Let's do this. First up is Lorelei. She leads with Dugong, and I lead with Chell. Chell is a beast. We easily tank all of Lorelei's attacks and take out her team one by one. By the time Jinx comes out, we're low HP so I switch into Delta to finish the battle. Next is Bruno. He leads with Onix and I lead with Momo. Momo hates ground types and easily takes out Bruno's Onix. Hitmonchan comes out next, so I switch into Kite to take him out with the fly. Bruno gets desperate and sends out his ace Machamp, so I switch into Dazel to tank a potential Rock Doom. Machamp uses Cross Chop instead, which brings us down to about half. We tank another Cross Chop and take out the Machamp. Totally forgot that Cross Chop has a high chance to crit, but luckily we go unpunished. Hitmonlee comes out next, so I switch into Delta. One fly later, and Hitmonlee goes down. Bruno sends out his final Onyx, but he doesn't know any Rock type moves. A few Dragon Claws later, and Onyx goes down winning us a second Elite Four battle. Next up is Agatha. She leads with Gengar, and I lead with Chell. Gengar sets up a double team, but Chell lands a second Psychic and takes her out. Agatha sends out Golbat next, who also goes down to a single Psychic. Arbok is next, and you can probably guess what happens. Gengar too. Haunter comes out last, but Momo easily takes her out, winning us an easy third battle. Last up is Lance. Our team is stacked with counters against his Dragon types, so I'm not too worried. Lance leads with Gyarados, and I lead with Chell. Thunderbolt easily takes out the Leviathan, and his follow-up Aerodactyl as well. Lance sends out Dragonite next, so I switch into Momo to take him out with a single Ice Beam. Both his Dragonairs meet the exact same fate too. And with that, that's the Elite Four taken care of. Finally, we step into the Champion Room to challenge Red. Red has terrorized us enough throughout our adventure. We've beaten him down each time we fought, and this time won't be any different. Our team covers each other's weaknesses, so we'll have no trouble at all. Let's do this. Red leads with Pidgeot, and I lead with Lemur. Lemur sets up two sword stances as Pidgeot spams Sand Attack. Little does Red know, I'm running Aerial Ace, which doesn't check for accuracy. One Aerial Ace easily takes out the Big Bird. Arcanine comes out next, so I switch into Delta to tank a Flamethrower. I use Fly, but Red's AI sees it coming and switches to Rhydon. I switch back into Lemur to set up before taking Rhydon out with the Steel Wing. Arcanine comes out again, but this time I go into Momo. Momo channels all her hatred towards fire types and one-shots Arcanine with the Surf. Red sends out Exeggutor next, so I switch into Kite to take him out. Unfortunately, Exeggutor is too bulky and puts us to sleep. He then lands a critical hit Egg Bomb, so I have to switch into Lemur. Exeggutor puts us back to sleep, but we set up on him and take him out with an Aerial Ace. Blastoise comes out next, so I chip away with the strength before switching into Dazel. Shout out to Blastoise for missing two Hydro Pumps by the way. Red must be pissed. Blastoise finally lands a Hydro Pump, but Dazel brings Blastoise to red health. Blue heals, but Dazel brings him back down. We are on low health now, so I switch into Chell, as Red switches to Alakazam. Alakazam sets up Reflect, so Chell's Tri-Attack does less damage. A Thunderbolt brings Alakazam to red health, but Blue heals back up. A following Tri-Attack manages to paralyze Alakazam, but his Synchronize means Chell is paralyzed too. His next Psychic then drops our special defense, so I have to switch into Lemur to tank the resisted Psychic. Thanks to the Paralysis, Lemur now outspeeds Alakazam, taking him out with the Steel Wing. Blastoise comes back out, and I switch into Momo as Red heals. We set up Calm Mind as Blastoise sets up the rain, and a few rain boosted Surfs take him out, winning us the final battle. And with that, our journey as Blue comes to an end. Professor Oak comes in to congratulate us for defeating Red and takes us to the Hall of Fame. I guess that's all it took to win our grandfather's love. Overall, this challenge was pretty simple, but it was really fun to walk through Kanto as Blue. It was so fun to use Pokemon like Machamp and Porygon 2 as well. For my next video, I can try Green or Yellow's team, but I'll be honest, their teams don't look like fun. Green uses a Ditto for Pete's sake. 
Fun for storytelling in the manga, not fun to take on the Elite Four. Half of Yellow's team is straight out of Route 1 in Viridian Forest. It'll definitely make for an interesting run though, so let me know what you guys think. Alternatively, I can jump to Gold's Adventures and do a Nuzlocke in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I'll be honest, besides his starter, I don't think I've used anyone on his team in a Nuzlocke before. I plan on doing all of them, but I'm curious to see what you guys are interested in. Also, thank you guys for being so patient with my upload schedule. I'm just one guy who's really passionate about Pokemon. I do every part of the video, including planning the route, filming the gameplay, writing the script, and editing all the parts together. It's a really fun process and I enjoy it a lot, but it does take a lot of time for me to make content at a quality that I'm happy with. I'm working as fast as I can to get these videos out while I'm juggling my last semester of college, so I really appreciate you guys for being here. And hey, if you've made it this far, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. Tell me what you guys would like to see for future videos, and I'll be sure to read each comment. Until next time, this has been Magnus. I'll catch you guys later. Hey everyone, it's me, Matt Pat, from Game Theory Still. Thanks for sticking around all the way to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. In the meantime, please check out my Five Nights at Freddy's theory. I think I'm onto something big here. Littered throughout the Five Nights at Freddy's series are a lot of connections with Pokemon. We have found evidence dating back to the 1990s that Ash Ketchum's missing father may have been intended to be the purple guy, aka William Afton. I'm still doing research, but I wanted to give you guys a sneak peek of my next video. Stay tuned. But until next time, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.